that happened quite some time ago. A couple adopted a five-year-old girl from Haiti. These new parents, or her parents, the little girl's parents, had been killed in a traffic accident and she was orphaned. This new couple who were to become the parents of this little girl went to Haiti and at the airport met the little girl and they walked together back into the plane to go home to where the couple lived and I believe they lived in Arizona. They flew back to the States and when they arrived, they sat down to eat their first meal together as a family, which is logical. And this couple already had two teenage boys that were quite a bit older, of course, than this little five-year-old girl. So this new family now, the new construction of this family, began to eat mashed potatoes and pork chops. And the two teenage boys, as teenage boys are, they ate one plate full after the other. And soon all of the food disappeared. And the little Haitian girl had never seen so much food on a table or the table in her whole life. And she had never seen so much food disappear so fast. <laughs> her eyes grew big and she became very, very quiet. Something was wrong, and the new mother figured it out. Where her new daughter came from, when the food was gone from the table, it might be something like days or longer before new food would be on the table. So what could reassure this new daughter? Well, the new mother took the little one by the hand and went over to the bread drawer and pulled out the drawer and showed her there were loaves of bread still there. And then she took the little girl to the refrigerator and opened it up, and I can imagine an American refrigerator. Lord have mercy. Anyway, they opened up the refrigerator and it was probably plum full of everything. The pantry as well. It showed the little girl there was food in reserve. The plenty was there, and the food would not run out, and the little girl would not be hungry again. Keep this picture in your mind as we hear our text this evening, found in Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. When I think of all this, writes Paul, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray for that his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. In the last few weeks, we have been thinking about the miracle of the church. The miracle of the church. It was born under the power of the Spirit. Just like Jesus was born through Mary by the power of the Spirit. So the church is a miracle. And the miracle of our belonging together. We're saints in the community. People who are defined by what God says and who God says we are, not by the world's dimensions. Something exciting has happened. We who were without a spiritual home, without God and without hope, we heard last week, have been brought into the family of God. Just as that little Haitian girl didn't do anything to become part of this new family, so we don't earn a place in the family of God. We don't earn it. 
Jesus has brought us in. He meets us at the airport and takes us by the hand and we fly home with him. To the Father who welcomes us at the table. I think this is something we need to hear again and again because we're often tempted to think we have to do something to earn the love of God. And I want to remind us all, no, we don't. We don't need to earn the love of God, just like this little Haitian girl couldn't earn the love of these parents, whom she met for the first time at age five. The words used in our text describe the greatness of this family that we've been adopted into. There are endless treasures available to us because we belong to this family. Yes, wake up everybody. We've had several wake up calls now already. Now everybody else can shut their handies down and we're good. We're good to go. There are endless treasures available to us because we belong to the family of God. Remember the parable Jesus told one time, he said, a man went out in a field and what did he see? He discovered a great treasure. I've often thought, how did he discover that treasure, treasure in that field? Did he go looking for treasure? Was he a treasure hunter? I don't know, but this guy, Jesus said, found a field that had a treasure in it. And because the treasure was so wonderful, he went and sold everything he had to buy that field so he could get the treasure. Having this treasure, Jesus says, is the most valuable thing we can have in our entire life. Let that sink in for a moment. What is it that we seek in this world? It's nothing compared to this treasure. Nothing. But like the little Haitian girl, after being in this new family, one might begin to think that the love of God will somehow run out. You ever thought about that? That God's love might run out on you? You know, maybe it's too good to be true. Is the gospel too good to be true? After all, perhaps Jesus going to the cross was certainly for other people long term, but for me? For you? Doubts about God's love may nag your mind. And certainly, there's an evil one who wants to encourage you to doubt all the time, day in and day out. Do you know that we're living in an evil time? I don't need to remind us, I don't think. There's much good in this world, no doubt, and I'm grateful for every good thing, but there is a cloud of ugliness that we sense when we live on the planet. There's a lot of wicked activity, and we're living in a time that stretches all of us to the max. I mean, just think of the digital struggles we all have. That's a stress that previous generations did not have. And it can compound our lives. It's very good. There's many good things. But it adds a level of stress and strain to our existence that wasn't there before. Then add on all the other levels of uncertainty around us. It can make us then think, well, where is God? Why is he letting all of this happen? If God is a God of love, why are so many people dying? Where is God in Palestine? Where is God in the Ukraine border? I would remind us all, God is very present in these places helping people in these places every day, day in and day out. We don't always hear the stories, but God is there. And God has the last word on all of these things, including God has the last word on all of the evil people causing these things. Do you know? Some of these gentlemen in the world, and they're mostly gentlemen, I think, who are doing these things, not that women are perfect, but I wish a few more were ruling, maybe we'd have more tempered responses. Perhaps they don't have the last word. But sometimes we may doubt. And, God, and Paul in our text is dealing with real people in a real church. And they had had other values prior to becoming Christians. They had been other, had other cultural norms before they met Christ. 
after becoming part of the family of God, did they think that the food might run out? That the treasure could be totally spent? Mean that God might not have any more for them? Or we may hesitate to respond to God's love because of our sense of not being good enough. I had an aunt, and I think I've mentioned this before, but my aunt, I had an aunt who never thought she was good enough for the love of God. She thought she was just too bad, too worthless to be loved by God. And therefore, it was always a struggle for her to believe that God really loved her. Have you ever felt like that? How could God love me? How could God love you? You might struggle with that. I want you to know that in spite of the way you feel, God is greater than your feelings. He loves you because you belong to Him in His creative act of making you. And He wants to restore you back into good relationship with Him. You're valuable to Him. For whatever set of reasons, it can be that we think like this. The good news means everyone is included, including you and including me, and even my aunt whom I hope, before she passed on, recognized God's love for her. My teenage brothers, can I have second helpings? They have second helping, but can I? Other people have this good relationship with God, but can I? Paul wants to assure these new Christians and us that there is fullness of life available to us. Fullness of life. We don't have to always live on the scarcity edge of spiritual existence. In the, in the way of knowing God, there is no limit to the resources that God has for us. We may feel limits in other ways, but there is no scarcity with God. Being at the table was for this Haitian girl the beginning of a lifetime in the family. Our being in the family of God isn't a temporary moment in time, like salvation for a day, like one good meal, but it's a lifetime of blessing. A lifetime of blessing. Paul told the Ephesians the path to reassuring ourselves of this reality of these exceptional blessings of God is to pray. Paul writes down this prayer for them, sends it to them, and maybe he said, use this prayer as a model for your own praying. Paul reminds himself in this prayer and is reminding the Ephesians that they have been adopted into the family of God. They're in. <clears throat> that Jesus has made all of this possible. And God's plan is being worked out in them for all share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Jesus Christ. All of us here in this room have the same inheritance. There is no one better or gets a bigger share than the other. Isn't that good news? Alfred does a lot of funeral work. It wears him out sometimes, the grief and uh, funerals at cemeteries. But one of the things that happens often is that people start to squabble about inheritance practically before the body gets in the ground or the ashes get in the, in the ground. People start arguing about how much they're going to get and how much the other one's going to get and you had more than me and ha I did it, 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 on and on and on it goes. What a nonsense when you get right down to it. The good news here is everyone gets the meal more. There's no one preferred. Hmm, that's good. The little Haitian girl was fully adopted into this new family, and in that position she would get more than the first meal of mashed potatoes and pork chops. She would enjoy future blessings. 
and the inheritance of a family member. If we remember all that God has given to us, the best response is prayer. A bowed knee, Paul says, I bow my knee thinking about all this. There's a certain sense of humility about all of this. What God has done for us is over the top. And it's a position when we're kneeling, you don't get up and run away very quick. If you take more time to kneel, especially those of us whose knees are not so good anymore, you don't get up that quick and run away. The position helps us to get into proper a tune with, with the Lord. Prayer gets us into an honest space with God. He is our Father. God is consistently on our side even when earthly fathers fail us. Sometimes people have trouble calling God Father because of their own fathers who haven't been so grand. To remind us all, God is the parent beyond our parents. He's not to be compared to their failures, or to their inadequacies, or then to their demandingness of us. That's not God. Sometimes we project onto God what we've experienced in our own families and say, well, if God's a father, I'm not sure I want that father. Well, remove and erase the images that you have about your own father when you look to him anymore. There's nothing outside of his concern. He is the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. God is the source of everything we need. And in a world where many people yell out scarcity, we discover a God of abundance. I don't think we can underscore that too much. We have a God of abundance, not of scarcity. This source of abundance is secure. So Paul can tell the Ephesians, you will be empowered. Verse 16 says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Empowered with inner strength through his spirit. Another facet of that phrase, inner strength or inner being, is inner man. And it's not meant here, man, male, or female. Inner man, inner person. And Marcus Barth, the theologian, says, it clearly is a title for Jesus. And he translates this verse, grant that through his spirit you will be fortified with power to grow toward the inner man through faith in the Messiah you may, that may dwell in your hearts. Jesus is the Messiah, the inner man within. And that inner person of Christ within us, the Messiah, is the one who can strengthen us from the inside out. His presence. Remember when Paul told the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ, yet it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Christ in us, yes, the source of strength. And making someone feel at home is only possible through increased trust, of course. How did the little Haitian girl feel like this new family was her home? That's a good question. She had to develop relationships. She had to learn to trust her two brothers and her father and mother. We learn through experiences whether someone is trustworthy. So if we experience Christ by trusting in him, then he will feel at home in our hearts and we will sense his presence and our very lives will become more rooted in the love of God. Like a strong tree with deep roots we will become stronger. Lest we think that the love of God is static, you know, something flat. Paul says that God's love is dynamic. I hope you've thought about that. Being in relationship with God is not static. It's dynamic. 
Do you want dynamite in your life? <laughs> Some pizzazz? Then get to know God more. Paul says there are dimensions to the love of God. God's love is wide, long, high, deep. And Paul prays that they will experience these dimensions of Christ's love. This gradual knowing will help us to become complete, Paul says, with all the fullness and power that comes from God. Does this sound too high? Does this sound like too much? Well, that's why I wanted to parallel the story of the little Haitian girl with this text. This theology is not pie in the sky. It's not something very far away. It's rooted in real life. How could this little girl feel at home or feel loved or grow into a sense of wholeness and fullness in her new family? Only through experiences of trust and the ongoing unconditional love of acceptance. I mean, that's something we as parents give our kids, unconditional love, even if we're not always getting it back when we think we need it. I remember it was Christopher, and whether if he listens to this, Christopher, you know we're in a good love relationship. But when he was a teenager and growing up and all these things, you didn't always know just what all that you invested, whether you get the dividends back. That's not how it is with unconditional love. My experience with not only my own family members, but with all the people in the church, unconditional love is what we can give to each other. That's it. Unconditional love. Because God has given us unconditional love. Now, it may not be simple to do that. That's why the spirit within us gives us the love we don't have on our own. I mean, none of us would have adequate love, would we? I fall short all the time with my own love. That's why I have to say, oh Lord, if you don't give me more, I'm in a deficit situation. But unconditional love of God is the kind of thing that we can begin to share with others so that there's a sense of acceptance. Imagine the dimensions of daily love that a little five-year-old girl would experience in this new family and grow across time. Just imagine what that would look like. Explore this thought for a moment in your own mind. What would that little girl experience? How would everyone show her love? How could she begin to trust that love? Think about that. And then apply that to your experience in the ongoing dimensions of God's love for you. We can imagine it in this other situation. But apply that to you and God's love for you. How can all of this love keep growing in our hearts and spilling out onto others? Paul says, think about all that God has done for you and pray for and about all of this. Take time to think about it and take time to pray about it. And that will help you to grow. And I think this thinking and praying isn't like saying, okay, now i got to go to a monastery for 10 weeks in order to do all this. No, I think you need to find space every day to stay, take partial time then, gradual time then, to reflect on what has God done for you. And then pray and say, thank you, Lord, and be in this dialogue with him. Paul longs for the Ephesians and for us to have a full life with power from the Spirit. And that is more than just having a full house. I was even thinking, I was preaching down this morning with God running in, and you know, there's a lot of different places where people gather together in prayer and fellowship. And sometimes there's many chairs that are empty. In places. We have a good group here tonight. In spite of the game that's coming later, we can cheer later on at 9 o'clock if you want to watch the game, and I presume some will here. And, but we're here, and yet it's not just having a full house that matters. What matters here is that we begin to have full hearts and full lives. Because if we begin to be full of God,
God's love and power, it will spill out in the places where we work every day, or the places where we live every day, or our family lives, it will slowly spill over. I grew up in uh, Minnesota, and along the Mississippi River, there were spillovers, they called it. That was when the river got too high, and they would let some water off, fall off, to spill over, so it wouldn't get too dangerous a backup of the river. I think God wants to give us so much love that there is a spillover in our lives. We have enough, but it spills over on other people. That is my prayer for all of us, that God will so give us the extras of his abundance that we can live in depth and fullness and be the people God really wants us to be and not be defined by other kinds of things but keep that dimension open where our resonance with God in our hearts allows us to resonate also well with others. It's a wonderful thing. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, how good it is to know you. And our desire, oh Lord, is help us to know you more and more. We just really need refreshing touches from you to keep us on target, to not get weary in our journey with you, but to keep being refreshed by your faithfulness that is new every morning. Help us, Lord, to draw on your resources and to be filled with your spirit so that we have enough to spill over on others. Thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts and minds. We pray together in your name. Amen. Amen.